we're really excited to have Chris Fenton here with us today. And Chris is, among a number of other things, the author of the recent book, which I have on my desk and he has behind him, um, Feeding the Dragon, Inside the Trillion Dollar Dilemma Facing Hollywood, the NBA, and American Business. For 17 years, Chris served as the president of DMG Entertainment Motion Picture Group. It's a multi-billion dollar global media company headquartered in Beijing, and he currently serves as the CEO of Media Capital Technologies, an entertainment finance company, and a trustee of the U.S. Asia Society. So Chris, really, really excited, looking forward to this conversation again. Um, I want to be able to give the audience a sense of who you are and what your background is. So maybe you can tell us first, I know you moved to LA pretty much right after you, sorry, the sirens, I'm you, you moved to L.A. pretty much right after you graduated from college and hustled your way into the entertainment industry, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how China kind of came, came on your radar and, and how you sort of became a, an expert in, in Chinese entertainment and investment. Yeah, sure, for sure. Well, first of all, thank you to the NCUSCR for having me. This is a wonderful opportunity. You and Margot have been fantastic. I want to thank Robert Daly of the Kissinger Institute and Dan Glickman, the former Motion Picture Association chairman for connecting us all. That was fantastic. Um, and I also saw on the attendee list some Cornellians on there. I went to Cornell, so I'm excited. Uh, we got some big reds out there. Um, also excited to have my book on the curriculum at, at Cornell and also various other schools. And I saw uh, other institutions represented on the list today. So I'm hoping you get engaged and entertained with this conversation in the book, and perhaps we see it on curriculums at your various schools, respectively, too. Um, a note on the book in regards to uh, the world of academia, um, it's, a, it's a bit like a liar's poker. Um, Michael Lewis, first person memoir, highly entertaining, but with lots of lessons intertwined in there. And one of the interesting things for students and for kids just graduating college is that um, I really walk through the story of how I even got here today. And quite frankly, it was super messy. And uh, it, many times it didn't go as planned. And, and, and it's just sort of how life unravels and, and sort of how you find certain opportunities and hopefully um, guides you into a really fun career. So I think um, younger kids really enjoy the book for that aspect too. Um, one other thing I wanted to make sure I said was that um, I do hope we hit some of the sensitive topics today. Clarinda and I were talking about that and hopefully we do engage in some of that. So I wanted to say that my views I'll share are mine and not necessarily reflect the stances of the US Asia Institute, which is an amazing organization I've been a trustee for for many years. Um, and also since I'm tackling some of these sensitive topics, um, I just wanna say one sort of macro theme, which is I fully believe that the US and China either coexist and continue to coexist through the bond formed by the exchange of culture and commerce, or we consciously start a cold war or even worse. And that's between the world's only two superpowers. And I strongly believe that and I'm fighting hard to keep such a necessary exchange ongoing yet under constructively rebooted bilateral relationship moving forward. Now with that said, you asked how did I get into this? Um, in the book, I, I briefly cover some of my early days, which was growing up in South Florida, moving to Connecticut in high school. My dad was an engineer for United Technologies. I ended up going to Cornell, got an engineering degree, and graduated in 1993. The economy wasn't particularly good back then. So, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't the greatest engineering student. I think I had a C plus, B minus average. So I didn't have a lot of opportunities thrown at me during that sort of downturn in the economy. So I got in my car and traveled cross country, stopping in various fraternity houses along the way and crashing until they kicked me out of the couch. And eventually I got to Los Angeles about seven months later. And I found this sort of Wall Street of the 90s business, which was the Hollywood business, which I knew absolutely nothing about, but it sounded really fun to get into. So in the book, I talk about my early days as a waiter at the Olive Garden, where I met some people and they helped me sort of get my first job in the entertainment business. I started my career in the mailroom at William Morris Agency, which doesn't exist anymore. It's now called um, Endeavor. Um, but then over the years, I grew into both a TV packaging agent and eventually a motion picture agent. And then one day, and this happens to a lot of people, 
throughout their career. I got called down to my boss's office. And for one reason or another, there were certain political issues and various things that I had run-ins with my direct boss on. Uh, I ended up getting let go. And it came quite shockingly to me, um, to the point where I remember that day walking through the hallway and feeling like everybody was looking at me. And, and suddenly this amazing career path that I seemed to be on got turned on its head. And I walked by my assistant and I said, hey, are you coming with me? I just got fired. And he's like, well, I got a pretty good job here. I think I'm going to stay. I'm like, that's okay. I'm all right with that. But I said, I'm not coming in the rest of the day. And I never actually went back. And I remember walking out of that agency almost like Jerry Maguire did from that sports agency he got fired from, where literally all I had was a goldfish in my hand. And I started going through my Rolodex and started calling everybody I could to try to gather as much business as I could to move on to the next part of my career. And during that process, I actually had one Chinese company. It was a company called Pace Setter Productions at the time. And they were making Western style commercials back in the 1999, 2000 period. And they had made a little movie called Cookers, which they financed with Chinese funding. It was an English language movie. And it sort of piqued my interest. It was very fresh, original. It obviously was made by people that were inspired by another culture that I wasn't particularly familiar with, nor was much of Hollywood. So I took a chance with them. And then after I got fired, of course, I called them up and said, hey, what are you guys doing? Are you interested in coming along with me? Um, and they said, well, geez, and now I got a phone ring and I apologize for that. Um, but they said, hey, uh, we haven't had a call from anybody at William Morris. Sure, we'll go with you. And that's sort of how my journey began with China. Next thing I know, I hopped on a plane and was heading to Beijing. And in Beijing, I saw everybody wearing hard hats. I saw construction cranes everywhere. And I realized, oh my gosh, there is so much opportunity in this country and it's just getting started. I need to dive into this now. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, and my, my colleague Margo just remind me, reminded me that I forgot to introduce myself when we started. So <laughs> just to rewind, my name is Clorinda Blaze and I am a program officer at the National Committee on US-China Relations. Um, Chris, I'm, I'm also curious about the title of the book, Feeding the Dragon. So I know you recall in a, in a, I think towards the end, a conversation with your wife, in which she kind of uses the term feeding the dragon and you sort of realize um, that you've been feeding the dragon. And I wonder if you could sort of elaborate on A, what you mean by that and B, why you chose it as the title of the book. Well, it's a great question. Um, a lot of the stories and anecdotes that I had been sort of experiencing through the last 20 years, I always knew would make a great tale to tell. So I had always thought about writing a book at some point. And the idea was just to write something super colorful and fun and, and showcase sort of the historics of, of 20 years that I experienced in the cultural and commercial exchange between the two superpowers that was just wildly chaotic and amazingly colorful. Um, what I didn't know was how I was going to perceive writing that um, over time and digesting exactly all my old notes and all my old sort of, um, you know, records that I had kept in order to put the book together. And the other thing that occurred was Daryl Morey um, tweeted uh, his support for Hong Kong and the Hong Kong protesters. Daryl Morey was the GM of the Houston Rockets, and this was last October in 2019. And what was interesting about that tweet was I had just gotten back from a U.S. congressional delegation trip through the U.S. Asian Institute with three congressional members, and we had gone to Hong Kong, and we had met with protesters, and we had met with Carrie Lam, who was, um, who's still running Hong Kong, um, and then we had also gone up to Beijing and various other cities in China. And I saw firsthand what was going on in Hong Kong at the time. And it didn't really register to me sort of the importance of, of that historic sort of period. And then when Daryl Morey tweeted that out, his support, and I saw that, I remember the first thing I thought was, that's going to be a problem for the NBA in China. I didn't for a second go, wow, that's a really smart, well thought of tweet that means a lot because there are people that are fighting for certain freedoms and various other things in 
in Hong Kong, and we saw that firsthand, and good for him. The first thing I thought about was the commerce that they had going on in China and how that was in jeopardy. And I didn't think anything more about it until the United States, the populace here, started to catch wind of how the NBA was fumbling and bumbling their reaction to his tweet. And over the course of a few days, we started to realize the American public was starting to get upset that it looked like the NBA was kowtowing to China in order to get business done in that country. And the bottom line is they were. And I thought about my 20 years and where I was in writing the book and how, oh my God, how did I not see that through the fog of war, what I was up to, right? We had this mission of globalism, this mission of free market capitalism that the more we open China to our products and services from the United States, the better it was for both the United States and the rest of the democratic world. Like we believe that. So anything we had to do to open up that market, we did it. And we didn't think about any sort of long-term effects on sort of the overall health of Americans overall, or how maybe we were compromising the values and principles of what makes it important to be Americans. We just were trying to open the market. And we were caught up in that fog of war as whatever cog in the wheel we were in that sort of exchange of capitalism. So when I looked back at what I had written, I started thinking, oh my God, there were moments in that 20 years where people actually were trying to wake me up to the fact that maybe we were doing things that we shouldn't be super proud of. And in that moment in the book where my wife says, are you sure you want to do that? It was one of those moments where I was explaining to her what we were trying to get done with this movie behind me. You see Iron Man 3, that's the Chinese poster for it. And what we were trying to do to convince the filmmakers in Marvel and Disney, the studio, to do in order to placate the CCP directive that if we did succeed at that, we would be able to monetize the movie on levels that had never been done before. And my wife said, are you sure you want to push the envelope with some of these things? Like it feels un-American. It feels like you're doing things that you're compromising what's true to you as a person and true to you as an American citizen. And I said, no, 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 no. This is all fine. We're going to do this. And, and then she said, well, the more you do it, the harder it is going to be to retreat back from it. So she called it feeding the beast. And I was like, well, it's actually not the beast. It's the dragon of China. And she's like, Exactly. You're feeding the dragon. And I said, well, you know, it's if you're a villager and the dragon lives nearby, you want to make sure you're sacrificing enough to make the dragon happy. And she said something like, well, yeah, but once you feed the dragon too much, it ends up becoming too powerful and you can never control it again. And that's sort of the thematic that I realized after the Daryl Morey tweet, I should bring into how the book ends and where we need to go from here. Because quite frankly, we have fed the dragon um, excessively. It's been very successful on a capitalistic basis, but it has not been successful on the long-term health and welfare of what we need as Americans to have a healthy society and a healthy country. So it's something where we need to find a way to sort of get back some of what we gave up while still keeping some sort of a symbiotic competitive strategic relationship with China. Maybe you could, for our audience, elaborate on some of the things you're referring to that you had to compromise in order to make the film suitable to the CCP or to get into the Chinese market. Um, what, what did that look like? What were some of the things you had to do that maybe made you a little bit uncomfortable that you justified then, but looking back on it now, think uh, maybe, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't go that far? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a bunch of different case studies I talk about in the book, and then also how we got to the point where we were making a $200 million plus movie with Marvel and Disney called Iron Man 3. So a lot of getting business done in China involves having that North Star, and you could say, in our case, we wanted to do a huge tentpole movie with Hollywood. So you set that North Star out there, but what are the baby steps that get you there? Because a lot of businesses, as you know, when they interact with China or they engage with China for the first time, they're always thinking of the North Star and how big and crazy that's going to be for their business. 
but they never figure out what they need to accomplish to get there. So it just becomes a waste of money and a waste of resources because they take on too much and they can never get it done. So in the case of getting to Iron Man 3, we, we did music publishing deals, we did you know television series, we did uh, certain things with Nike and the NBA and around the, uh, the uh, Beijing Olympics in 2008. And then we started doing small movies and then we got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually we got to the point where we were able to convince Disney and Marvel that we were capable of taking one of their prized possessions and making it into this behemoth. So one of the baby steps that I'll talk about prior to that was a movie called Looper. And if anybody has seen Looper, that's a Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Bruce Willis, Emily Blunt, sci-fi thriller. And it takes place in the present day and also 40 years in the future. It's directed by Ryan Johnson, who's directed some of the Star Wars films. The original script for that movie had the future taking place in France. And Bruce Willis was going to marry a French woman. And he plays essentially Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, but 40 years older. We convinced the 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 filmmakers involved, hey, what if you move the future of the world in the movie from France to China? And of course, they were reluctant to. They had a great script and they're like, we love France and why would you do that? And of course, we kept piling on all the front page articles about China and how the weight of the world was moving over there and how Asia was going to be the center of all capitalism and the economies and all that kind of stuff. And then eventually we won them over. Plus we were investing money from China in the film to give them more production days and give them access to a market that otherwise they wouldn't have access to for a movie like that. Once they agreed to that, then we had to work with the Chinese government because Looper has time travel in it. Time travel is completely banned for Western forms of content inside China's borders. Why is that? because the CCP wants to control the narrative of where their country is going in the future and wants to control the narrative of where they came from in the past. So they get super nervous about anybody talking about time travel in a movie, especially from a film from a foreign uh, market. So what we had to do was describe to them how we were gonna take the future and put China on this pedestal. Make, showcase the country as one of the greatest places on earth a technological advanced city of Shanghai. We were gonna show the greatest skyline you've ever seen and really make China look like, yes, that is where Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, if he could go anywhere in the world when he retires, would wanna go. So we worked with the Shanghai municipal government and we designed their skyline. We essentially worked with them to say, what do, your sky, what do you want your skyline to look like 40 years in the future? And obviously some of those bureaucrats had no idea. So we would have to do mock-ups and various other things. And we'd use Chinese symbolism and Chinese coins and some of the architecture or different characters like Ren and various other things that were symbolic for China. And we built this city. And then of course they said yay or nay to some of them. And cut to today, you still have some of those models and some of those designs in the Shanghai municipal government offices because they are so proud of the way we portrayed their city. And then on top of it, of course, we brought in a, a Chinese actress to play the role of Bruce Willis's wife because he's now in China. So her name was Summer Ching. We also brought over a lot of our production and our first unit production in order to shoot and showcase China and also do skill set exchanges with their people in the film industry. Because one of the things we wanted to do was not only showcase China and make something very proud and, and noteworthy for the CCP to look at and say, wow, that was great with what you did with the movie inside the movie itself, but what else are you gonna do for us? So the other thing we wanted to do was prove that by shooting in China, by bringing, bringing over best in class people in the film industry from Hollywood, we could train their people to learn the process of filmmaking, train their people to learn the process of script writing and, and below the line and gaffing and electrician and all that kind of stuff so they could be a world-class industry someday too. And I look at it today and I look at the way the market's going and I realize we did that a little too well because they're actually making movies on par with the way Hollywood does it. But going back to Looper in 2011, 2012, 
that was an amazing sort of accomplishment for us. And the CCP rewarded us with that by giving us the official October holiday release date, which is never given to a Western uh, form of content. It's always local language movies. And they allowed us to get 43% of the return of the box office versus at the time, which was for Hollywood movies of only 13 to 17%. So it got us a lot of wind to the back because we carried out certain directives by this, that the CCP wanted so well. And so were, were there things, the things that you just talked about in making it so that you got that co-production status and you got that release date in China, the things that you had to do in order to get there, what of them, if any, would you be less willing to do or advise other producers, um, production companies to do in order to to get that status well it's a it's a really good question because there's a lot of times where you're going well some of this stuff is very um you know it doesn't have it, there's no victim involved right you're just being good at business and creating something that is very relevant for their market and gives a lot of wind to your back both with the government which you have to sell to first and then eventually to the consumer um, where I and, I, and by the way, we do that for all kinds of other sort of markets or kinds of consumers, right? Like I look at the Fast and Furious franchise where they cast Michelle Rodriguez as one of the main characters because the Latino community loves the car culture. So that's really good commerce. That's not something where you're going, oh, they're playing the Latino propaganda game or something, right? So there is a fine line between it. Where I see some of the biggest problems, the biggest issues, is the encroachment that we've seen on the narrative and on what we're able to display in storytelling outside of China's borders. And we even saw it in Looper's case where we actually, to make the best movie possible, we couldn't get all the China footage in the film that the Chinese government wanted. And that wasn't just for the, Chinese, for the China market, it was for the world market. And they put a lot of pressure on us to make sure we had as much China footage in the global cut of the movie possible to the point where they were pushing us almost to make a worse movie because of it, right? Ultimately what we did, and as you learn in the book, is we made two cuts of the movie. One was this extended version of a film that the Chinese saw, and then a shrunk down version of the movie that we let the rest of the world see. And we were able to get that done, and the CCP signed off on it. That is not allowed anymore. And that was sort of the early days of that pushing their narrative across their borders for the rest of the world. So where we see it now today is like Senator Ted Cruz brings up or the PEN America report brought up recently, which is the latest Top Gun movie where Tom Cruise wears a flight jacket and on the back of it is the Taiwanese and Japanese flag. The CCP says, we won't let you show that movie in our market if you have that on the back of the jacket. So the Hollywood studios, Paramount and Skydance and the filmmakers say, you know what, that's okay, We're, we'll be okay with that. Now, I get it. Certain China hawks are going to say, no way, you can't do that. But there is a business aspect to this. So I will defend them on saying that's okay for that market. Why also is it okay? Because we do it for Japan with certain things. We do it for South Korea with certain things. We do it in the Middle East for certain countries. So it is something that is relatively standard for given markets. Where I have the problem is what the CCP said. Well, if you have those flags on the jacket anywhere else in the world, you got a problem too, right? We will not let you release the movie here. And in fact, we might even damage the ability for Paramount and Skydance and the filmmakers to do future business in our market if you let those flags on, right? And I'm thinking to myself, that is not acceptable, right? I get it for their market, but to say we can't let somebody in Argentina or somebody in Peoria, Illinois, or somebody on the Upper West Side of New York City or somebody in Paris, France, see the Taiwanese flag or see the Japanese flag on that jacket, that is something we have to stop. That is an encroachment on our freedom of expression, our freedom of, uh, of speech, our creative individual style that is so important to what Hollywood represents. To have that encroached upon is something we need to push back on and get the CCP to retreat on. 
I just want to remind the audience to feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A function. I'm going to ask you one more thing. Um, going back to the NBA and also related to what you were just talking about in terms of the CCP kind of encroaching on our freedoms of speech domestically in the U.S. And you, I believe, recently published an op-ed in the South China Morning Post sort of about your thoughts on this. And you also retweeted yesterday a clip from an interview with Megyn Kelly and Mark Cuban, who's the owner of the NBA Dallas Mavericks. And in the interview, Megyn Kelly is pressing him to outwardly decry or condemn the human rights violations happening in Xinjiang. And he wavers on it and he's flat-footed and eventually he says, oh, well, I've been trying to advocate for increased um, spots for asylum seekers coming from China and at the end, she says, you know, but why are you taking $500 billion from China? Why do you continue to do business there, even, even being aware of the human rights violations in Xinjiang? And he says, well, look, I still, I still want to do, China is a customer, and I want to do business in China. And I, I wonder, A, what your reaction is to his response and to this clip. And, and if you could tell us a little bit more about the, the strategy that you've, you've outlined um, in your op-ed in the South China Morning Post. Well, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for taking us into sensitive areas here. Um, first of all, I, I, I do respect Mark Cuban. I, I think he's a, a, an amazing entrepreneur. And I actually really, um, I, I agree with a lot of the stuff that he says on various topics. Um, yesterday's interview, I thought was a complete fail of his. Um, I'm not exactly sure why he even walked into that interview, knowing that that question might come up. And then I'm even more surprised that he wasn't prepared with an answer. But I'm not going to put full blame on Mark Cuban. The problem is that, and Disney just had this with Mulan too, in the same area, Xinjiang province, and, and the, the issues there, which we've read quite a bit about. Um, it goes into the freedom of speech issue that I talked about earlier in regards to the Top Gun movie. What we need to do, and, and this is something Susan Thornton talked about recently on one of your interviews, um, is there needs to be reciprocity in regards to the ability to critique each other. The Chinese are able to critique America and things they don't agree with with America and Chinese companies can do that and the Chinese government can do that. In fact, read the Global Times any single day and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and they can do that without any sort of retaliation from our government in regards to shutting down their business or their industries, right? Here in the United States of America, on American soil, we do not have the ability to critique things we do not agree with on China. Um, the Xinjiang atrocities of the Uyghurs, uh, the Hong Kong protesters, things we don't like about communism in general, you name it. There's lots of things that we don't agree with because quite frankly, we don't agree with on things in politics, national security or, or human rights issues. Um, and that's a problem because one of the most inherent, most important, most vital rights we have as Americans is our ability to speak freely about things. It's something that is so protected here and so important. So when I look at Mark Cuban, all I want to do is what I think every person that watches that interview wants him to do, which is to simply say, I condone what's happening in China. We do not accept it. And we would like to do everything possible to continue voicing that so that one day China changes their policy and their behavior. We're not asking Mark Cuban to go fix the problem. We're not asking LeBron James to go fix the problem. We're not asking the NBA to fix the problem. What we're asking them to do as Americans is to voice what we all believe in and what is right. That is it. And China, if they are thinking logically and practically, which I know they are because they had me speak in Beijing two Saturdays ago about this issue and they didn't censor it at all. And then they allowed me to post an op-ed in the South China Morning Post, which makes me believe that they are seeing that this is potentially a baby step that can get us somewhere towards some sort of better North Star. And that is allow us on American soil to say what we wanna say about things we don't agree with with them. And allow us to do that without any sort of retaliation against us with their market. 
right? Their market obviously has a lot of leverage. They know that if they shut out Paramount for putting that flag on the jacket so that people in Argentina can see it, that market shut, shutting out Paramount is a big problem for Paramount and Paramount sh shareholders and investors. The same thing if Mark Cuban said something about what's going on over there and the way we want him to say it, that could be a huge problem for the NBA, especially since they were on a one-year probation period where they had no access to that market and they finally got game five on the other day. So we need to see this ability to diffuse, to pressure release things that are creating issues between the two countries. And simply by allowing us to have the ability to say what we want to say, even if it's not going to get us anything, but just be able to have that First Amendment right and to do it without retaliation will actually keep tempests in the teapot, right? If I look at what happened with Mulan, which is sort of similar to what happened with Daryl Morey's tweet, is that that was something that could have been easily contained. Daryl Morey's tweet was simply a tweet, seven words. It tweeted out, China has a firewall, could have easily been blocked from most of their populace from ever knowing he tweeted that out. And that would have been the, the end of it. No retaliation, nothing. But instead what happened is the CCP retaliated against that. It became a huge PR issue over here. Not only just a PR issue, but like with Milan, it became a legislative issue where you had senators and congressmen get involved. It became essentially what was a tempest in a teapot, it turned into a massive eruption volcano. And then the same thing happened on the China side where they retaliated. Of course, the China market wants NBA games. So the NBA, they're wondering, why is the NBA off? Of course, enough of that news gets through because it starts to create so much turmoil that the firewall can't even block it. And it starts creating a face loss on the China side, just as much as a face loss over here. So my point is, simply let us say what we have the right to say, block it from your populace, and you won't see these little sparks in the kindling turn into massive face loss, you know, sort of episodes where now you got everybody talking about it when it could have easily just gone away. And the beauty of being able to talk about this stuff here in the U.S. is that by talking about it, we can start coming up with potential solutions to the issues. And that guides us to a North Star eventually someday, that day where maybe we hope that the CCP no longer runs China and become a democracy or whatever that North Star is. We can't even think about getting there if we're not allowed to talk about it. And by the way, the one other thing I'll add is the C-suite execs that either run the NBA or run Disney or run Apple or Nike, the ones that have all this pressure from the public and from senators and from congressmen and from critics in the press, suddenly by letting them say what we all want them to say, that pressure goes away too. And then all that other sort of heated animosity towards people that are hypocritical about, oh, you're Disney and you're supposed to be freedom of speech believers and allow that as a conduit and a vehicle for filmmakers, et cetera, suddenly they don't have that hypocrisy they're living with anymore and they can focus on the task at hand, which is good business, good filmmaking. The NBA can focus on things. We can have our legislators focus on more important things, et cetera. And China allows something to deflate before it turns into a massive geopolitical issue. We've got a related question from an anonymous attendee who asks, how can there be coexistence between conflicting ideologies? One permits and encourages political speech, while another stifles such speech, and not just within its borders. So what is a strategy to work together given this backdrop? All right, well, that's great. It goes right into Fenton's five forces of diplomacy, which I like talking about, which are human rights, uh, national security, politics, commerce, and culture. Those are the five that I think are super important between the US and China. Three of them, we will never agree on. We will never agree with them on human rights, politics, or national security issues. All we can do is get to the point where we agree to disagree. And if you think of it as cell phone to cell tower with five bars of service, we're down to two bars. And quite frankly, two bars of service is pretty solid. I mean, I might be on this Zoom webinar with two bars of service and it's working okay, right? Um, as long as we have commerce and culture exchange, 
I think we can have some semblance of a com strategic competitive relationship. We're never going to be best friends with them. We're never really going to be friends with them. We're always going to sleep with one eye open. They're always going to sleep with one eye open with us too. But we're both superpowers. We're both nuclear powers. We are super entangled and super, super interconnected with everything economically that to just say, hey, you know what? We're never going to agree with them on all this stuff that's super vital to being American. So let's just cut them off. Well, that's what we did post-Korean Peninsula War and up to the days of ping pong diplomacy. And that was doable back then because China was very, you know, they were worried about their own internal issues. They were a sleeping giant at the time or a sleeping dragon. Today, they are not that. So if we cut off everything like we had back then, we're going to be in a real problem. We're going to have a Cold War a la like we had with the USSR back in the 80s, except with a country that's going to soon have the largest economy in the world, has way more many people and way more resources to be very, very damaging to us. Got another question from somebody who appears to be at UCSD who asks, what has been the actual financial fallout of banning the Houston Rockets games in China this past season. And if you can comment, what's the response among Chinese fans to NBA's Black Lives Matter advocacy in the postseason? Well, that's a good question. Uh, UCSD, great surf spots down there, by the way. Um, let's see, if, if you look at the damage economically, I mean, there's all kinds of numbers being thrown out there. I mean, just in terms of the Houston Rockets itself, which keep in mind the Houston Rockets are probably the best branded team when it comes to China, simply because they had Yao Ming, which was the greatest you know, basketball star ever for them on the Houston Rockets all those years. So there's estimates that the cost of what Fertitta paid for the Houston Rockets probably um, dropped over 20% from what he purchased it for versus what it's worth today because of the way they've been shut out of China. And when I mean shut out of China, that means they're not aired on CCTV networks. Um, I don't think they've been aired Houston Rockets, for instance, even on the streamers and replays. Um, they don't have merchandise for sale over there, et cetera. So it's a big hit to that one particular team. For the NBA overall, you have obviously the big rights that are involved with the CCTV5 network, which is their ESPN network, which essentially fully went away. And then you had all the sponsors that didn't want to tread near the NBA that all sort of fell out until they realized back, you know, they'll realize at some point that maybe the NBA is back in good favor. Um, I don't know if that's the case yet, but we might see that happen soon. So you had endorsement potential, you had their major broadcaster, and then you had on top of it, most of the merchandise was taken off of shelves for the majority of the past year. So you're looking at the billions of dollars. Um, in regards to the BLM movement, what I will say, because I don't, that's, the BLM movement is out of my lane, so I'm not really going to tread in there too much, other than the fact that if you read the Global Times or you pay attention to the way the CCP narrative through the Ministry of Propaganda looks at the BLM movement, they see that as a really interesting sort of um, showcase of how messy democracy is and how messy our freedoms can be here in the United States. And it showcases the, the essentially the security disturbances in the big cities, um, how there's not a a uh, feeling of like a together country and something that they then compare to communism in a way that they say, hey, look at what's happening over there. Let's really sort of beat the drum on all that stuff that looks really terrible on screen. And of course they dra dramatize it as much as possible. And then they say, and look at how great it is here. Look at communism. We brought 600 million people out of poverty. We have a, a roaring back economy because we handled COVID perfectly. We have, you know, housing and food for everyone. We don't have turmoil between minorities or, you know, that's what they say. So they're using it as a propaganda tool and it's actually coming very in, in handy very well. Sure. We have another question in from Elizabeth Economy of the Hoover Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, and she's also a board member at the National Committee. She asks, if China does not take a step back from trying to control speech outside its borders around issues such as Hong Kong or Taiwan, 
or other issues it deems sensitive, what should be the US strategy? Reciprocity would imply that we would respond in kind. Well, I mean, look, we're seeing it in the press, in the world of press, which is sort of interesting because they kick out some of our journalists, we kick out some of theirs, yet what's interesting is like our journalists don't really have access to use the platforms of those Western news platforms to showcase what the real news is inside China, yet we allow the journalists, the Chinese journalists here to, to use the China platforms, whether it's China Daily or Global Times or whatever, that's all readable by the US, right? The US public can see all that stuff. So there isn't even reciprocity in the, in the freedom of the press, um, which is something that we've been trying to symbolically govern a bit, but we, we've been losing that battle. I think when it comes to freedom of speech rights, I just don't see, I mean, we are, a democracy. We're a, a free society and we don't want government to over control certain things that we feel are inherent rights to the public, right? So if somebody is, if they retaliate against us um, because somebody's using their free speech rights here in the United States and criticizing something, the idea of us then reciprocating that with shutting down a particular business because they're criticizing us about something seems very undemocratic to me. And I don't think we would support something like that. Now, where I could see support, and we talk about the BLM movement, is a domestic issue like BLM or like the, um, you know, the violence with police against minorities, et cetera. That ability for the NBA to boycott playing games, to make a statement, and then to pull in the solidarity of all the other sports leagues out there, which also boycotted on behalf of that message and also brought in a lot of the players in the sports industry too. I think that is a good case study of what we could do to unify against certain encroachments from the CCP. So for instance, if they retaliate against Paramount, if they say, no, we're not going to give up, you know, we're not going to let you have free speech rights. You got to take the Taiwanese flag off of the jacket. Paramount says, no, we're not. And then China retaliates. Now, where I could see us winning that battle is if the rest of Hollywood, the Hollywood industry says, hey, we're going to be in solidarity of Paramount and the rights of our filmmakers to have their creative expression freedoms. And if you're going to retaliate against Paramount for that, for that issue, we as Hollywood are united not to send any more of our product over there until you fix it. And then that would include also Disney's going to close their theme parks and Universal's going to close their theme park that's opening in Beijing. And IMAX is going to close their theaters to Chinese productions, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly you have a unified front like we saw with that NBA example. Um, but on an international issue rather than just a domestic issue. And if we know one thing about Americans is that if we unite on something, we have great strength in numbers and we almost always win. The problem is figuring out how to unite people on something like this that's so distant in a distant land. But I do think through the right type of conversations through leaders, whether it's you know, a Bill Gates in the tech business to a Phil Knight in the sports industry to the MPA in, in, in the Hollywood business. Like there's a way to gather momentum to create that type of teamwork framework so that we do have the leverage to make the CCP and China backtrack and retreat from some of the things that they've encroached upon over the past decade. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. We have an interesting question in from Angela Yu. She asks, is the relationship between the US and China's film industries unbalanced? I.e., does one significantly rely more on the other? And how will COVID affect future synergies between China's film industry and Hollywood? Okay, so Hollywood was super, in order to build a film industry, post the 2008 Olympics, the Chinese government said in their 50, 100 year plan, here are a bunch of industries that we want to build into world class. 
One of them happened to be the film industry. In order to get the film industry going, A, you got to create a best in class sort of um, industry that can make their own product that caters to their market. And also you need an exhibition and sort of an infrastructure to be able to showcase that film industry appropriately. So one of them involved a lot of development of real estate, whether it was commercial or residential, that involved huge, huge theater complexes in the first, second, and third tier cities. In order to fill those screens, they didn't have the type of local production that would get people excited to show up to the movie theater. So they had to rely on Hollywood to bring those imports in and get people excited about those movies and fill those essentially um, theaters. Right now I got my dog barking. Um, anyway, the, <laughs> the bottom line is the, the, at that time, there were essentially like 90 cents of every dollar was coming from Hollywood movies in the marketplace. And then you cut to today, or let's go to 2019 pre, pre-COVID, we have over, uh, I would say 65% of that market is dominated by local movies. So it's gone from 10% to 65%, right? And that's because we helped them create this best in class infrastructure and best in class ability to make great movies for their populace that is now better in the eyes of their consumer than what's coming from China or from coming from Hollywood. So that's a a bit of a problem, right? But we've seen the dynamic shift where now Hollywood really needs China to buy our stuff because we're losing out on other marketplaces and China doesn't really need our stuff as much anymore. So it's a really sort of worst case scenario. Now you add COVID into the mix And what we're seeing here in the United States of America is this very fragile theatrical movie going experience, which was on sort of pins and needles to begin with, completely thrown on its head by COVID. Now people, theaters are open in much of of the country, but most people don't even want to go to the movie theater. And on top of it, the studios are reluctant to release movies in movie theaters because of that. So we look at how, or we look at China today, and China's market is thriving. They have a movie in theaters there that's already hit almost a half billion dollars, and they have another one at about three hundred and fifty million, and that's just for the China market alone. So now Hollywood, if they didn't really need China before, they really need them now. So that's where the leverage in this situation is starting to become a ticking clock. Where if we don't act soon, we might never have the leverage, even with everybody united and trying to push back together. We might get to a point where we've gone past the tipping point. And that's something that I'm trying to get out there and talk about as a squeaky wheel, where this is not something we should stay with our heads in the sand on anymore. It's something we need to activate now. And it's not just on a commercial level, right? Like in trying to save that market by pushing back on things, getting a greater return on our box office results, tearing down their protectionist policies that only allow us 35 movies in a year. I mean, it's not just on the commercial side. It's also on the values, principles, rights, like we talked about in free speech, and even on national security issues. So if we don't start to get serious about this now, we might never have the opportunity again to get them into a retreat where we get some of this stuff back that's so valuable to us. That question had come from Angela Yu, who later wrote in that she's a former intern at the National Committee. So we're, we're glad to have our interns on our programs. Um, it seems appropriate now to maybe, given what you just said, circle back to the philosophical question. And we have an anonymous attendee who says, we've seen many brands be internet shamed by China for various reasons. Um, he cites NBA, Tiffany's, Nike, all as examples. How should these companies react? How do you balance a firm's profit with their values? So are you, t- I guess the question is, is are we talking about U.S. citizens on, on the internet or Chinese citizens? I think Chinese citizens. Because um, one or, thing or, I'll no, say. Actually, probably US. both. Okay, yeah. so let's talk about the U.S. citizen, right? There's, there's issues where 
now the populace, the pub, the public, the American public, and and so the critics and legislators, et cetera, are now very aware. They're woke to the idea of kowtowing to China in order to get our products and services into that market. In the old days, up until Daryl Morey's tweet, I would argue the only thing I worried about are others trying to get a product and service into that market. Um, the only thing that we met, we cared about was really how are we going to sell why that product or service being allowed to monetize itself in China was good for the CCP. You had to get them signed off. And then once they signed off on that, you had to get the consumer engaged and excited about whatever that product and service was. So it was two messages to do two different in, you know, entities. Now I think it's super important to create a third message. And that third message is the American companies that are doing business in China have to give a narrative here in the United States of America of why they're engaged with China, why they're selling their product and service there, what are they doing to get it in there, and why, most importantly, is it good for Americans, right? Is it creating jobs here? Are they protecting jobs here? Are they offshoring them? Are they bringing money back over from China that normally wouldn't come here? And if they are, that's increasing our GDP. And if they're somewhere in the cultural exchange of things, are they helping bring soft power influence from a democracy into a communist country? If so, you're suddenly checking lots of boxes that make people really, really excited about that particular company or industry doing business in China. But if, if it's kept quiet and people are just like, wait, I don't understand what you're doing there or whatever, people are going to critique it. And then obviously, if you have a Milan situation or an NBA situation come up or various other Activision just got in hot water recently, I mean, there's very, uh, it seems like there's examples every week, which makes <laughs> my job sort of easy of keeping this conversation going. Um, then you're going to get a lot of criticism from the internet. And on the China side of things, just keep in mind, they get one essentially party line. Like it's, China is so interesting because the Ministry of Propaganda now is directly involved with the 1.4 billion people there that they're trying to keep just happy enough that they don't revolt. And that gives them a lot of power over the narrative that those people hear. And it's almost as if you had CNN and MSNBC and Fox and Rachel Maddow and Tucker Carlson all on the same page every day about saying the exact same thing. And that's all the 330 million people heard here in the United States. Imagine that. That would be really interesting. But in China, that is the case. So if suddenly the Ministry of Propaganda wants criticism to diffuse into the population because Tiffany is doing something sort of that they don't agree with, maybe they're recognizing Taiwan as a, you know, an independent country or whatever it is, they're going to get enough momentum from the netizens, right, the internet citizens, to start speaking up and creating a problem for that consum the, the consumption of whatever that product and service is. And we saw that actually in 2012 with Japan, a lot of car dealers from, you know, the, the, the Nissans and the Toyotas had Molotov cocktails thrown at them, et cetera, when there was this nationalism created around these rocky islands that obviously China was trying to say were theirs and Japan was saying was ours. And that created a huge sort of rally around the flag narrative that started to harm Japanese products and services that were trying to attract consumer interest there. And that's the same thing that can happen at any given day, at any given time with anything that's coming in from the West. They can flip a switch and make consumers suddenly go, I don't need that anymore. Or in fact, not only do I not need it, I'm going to make sure other people know that they don't need it too. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Charlie Wong asks, with the size of the Chinese market now, it seems almost inconceivable that studios would unite in solidarity to oppose CCP requirements. The profit motive seems too great to make a stand on values. Has there been an example of this kind of solidarity in recent years in any industry? Well, I brought up the I brought up the recent case study with the NBA getting the rest of the sports industry around a domestic issue. Now, I 100% agree with that question. I could be full of unicorns and rainbows on this, right? 
But I'd like to believe if you look through the history of Americans, when it was time to rally, when there was something important enough to actually make a stand, we've done it and we always succeed. So I would like to believe that we will build up enough momentum and pressure on C-suites of Hollywood, of the tech companies, of aerospace, of whatever industries they are, so that if they don't band together and they don't create a unified front to push back on the recent encroachment from the CCP, they might see a retaliation here by the consumers in the United States. And if that's the case, then suddenly it's hitting their bottom line where they're actually located, in their homeland. So there's always the ability to pressure to get something done. And I feel like that pressure is bubbling. We obviously have seen the Senate, the House, um, bipartisan get involved in this issue. We're starting to see journalists get involved in it. We're starting to see covered on various programs, whether it's CNN or MSNBC or Fox that might not have covered it before. So the momentum is building. And I feel like as that momentum builds, the pressure gets harder and harder to just put their heads in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist. So it's very important for people that watch a, you know, a, a, a conference like this, or to you know, get involved as a squeaky wheel, or to just keep the dialogue out there over a dinner table. Because the more people that are talking about this, the more pressure is put on the individuals that can help fix it, and the better America will be in the long run. And quite frankly, if we find a nice balance between the US and China and things that don't irritate them too much and don't irritate us too much, we're going to have a much better relationship in the long term, too. Because keep in mind, right now, the way we're acting between each other, it's like a couple that really should get divorced, but is just trying to sort of hang on to it and, you know, whatever means, means possible and using duct tape every way they can. If we can get to a point where we can actually, like, push back and find that nice common ground, yes, we're never going to be best friends, but we'll have a heartier sort of better strength relationship that will allow us to get more cooperative and collaborative stuff done and quite frankly sell a lot more products and services in that market. I want to sneak in one more question that you can maybe comment on quickly. I, you're going to laugh when I read you the question. Emma Wong asks, there seems, not because the question's funny because you're not going to be able to comment on it quickly, um, there seems to be a trend of American politicians and businesses thinking that the more we engage with the Chinese economy and have cultural exchange, this may affect Chinese politics. However, since the Cold War, such hopes have not seen fruition. Do you think there is potential for China to be a democracy? If so, why? Okay, uh, that's, that's a lengthy question. And by the way, I'm, on the, I'm at the Dragon Feeder if anybody wants to engage with me on Twitter. So just FYI. Um, when it comes to achieving democracy in, in China, I think that can be an ultimate North Star, like something that we just know the more we push and push and push over the long term. Remember, they play a 50 to 100 year game. We should play the same one with these really big lofty North Stars. I do think they engage with our culture really well. They engage with things that have the cultural fabric, the identity, the aspirational qualities of democracy. And that slowly, slowly, slowly starts to bleed into their populace and they start to engage in it more and more. Whether they're gonna continue believing that communism is the best form of government for them or not is really gonna depend on how we behave with democracy here and how hard it will be for their government to show how bad democracy is versus communism. Right now, I would argue, it's very easy for them to cut and edit different tape together to make democracy look really messy and ugly and make communism look better than that, right? But at some point, we're going to find a nice sort of calmness in this country, I hope, where we are working much more effectively as a democracy. And as that hits in our products and services that carry that aspirational quality continue to get in there, in the long run, I will be rainbow and unicorn. And I will say that at some day, maybe long after I'm gone, we might be able to win them into a democracy. Chris, thanks so much for your time today. It's been really great talking to you. We've just shared your Twitter in our chat box. Um, 
So we encourage everyone to continue the conversation with you. I really appreciate what you've, you've done in, in bringing this conversation to the National Committee and to the larger audience. Again, his book is Feeding the Dragon. Um, thank you again, and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. I absolutely loved it, and thank you all for sitting through that past hour, and I hope, I hope you got something entertaining, engaging out of it, and please, Keep spreading the word. This is something that affects red and blue all across America. This is something we need to tackle. And quite frankly, as I told you, we can do it in baby steps and we can accomplish certain check boxes. So just keep spreading the word and keep thinking positively because I do think we can have a better relationship with them in the long run that also puts American health first. Thank you, everyone. Take care.